One great last uh, main stage presentation for you before we leave. Uh, in a, a lot of ways, this presentation embodies a lot of what's great out of XDS for me. Uh, a couple years ago, I was at an XDS uh, event and we had a breakout session in which we were asked to write on index cards services that we thought would be great to find more resources for uh, among providers. And near the top of the list, if not the top of the list, was UI UX. At the time, for AAA developers, there just weren't a lot of partners out there to uh, work with. Well, now we've had one great presentation for those of you here who are here for the uh, UFC one that just ended and now this one. Another great way that this sort of embodies XES is that two of our presenters, this is their first time at XES, and here they are presenting on the main stage. And uh, if their expressions at the mixer last night were anything to judge, they're having a great time. Uh, finally, I just want to say, I want to acknowledge the work of one person who couldn't be here, uh, Isabel Poirier, who is the Director of Strategy and, Perform uh, and Performance at BCOM. Uh, she's represented well, but uh, I wish she could be here because she worked very hard on this presentation. But without any further delay, please let me introduce Frederick Tremblay, VP of uh, Strategic Accounts at BCOM, Alexis Russell, producer at Avalanche Studios, and Steve Woodzell, senior UI artist at Avalanche Studios. Give them a warm welcome. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, man. Thanks, Alex. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Tremblay. I'm, uh, I'm VP of Strategic Accounts at BCOM Studios. Uh, I've been, uh, over the years, uh, I've been privileged to work with amazing uh, clients, helping uh, their brands develop their presence across multiple platforms, uh, including games, of course, website, apps, marketing campaigns, AR, VR experiences, you name it. <laughs> so working on so many different projects and devices helped Become Studios develop very strong skills in UX and UI uh, design. To the point where we began, I think like three, three years ago, begin, we began thinking about outsourcing uh, our UX and UI skills uh, to different studios around the world, such as uh, Wizards of the Coast, uh, Ubisoft, Calypso, Beamdog, and of course, Avalanche Studios. Uh, I'm very happy, very happy to be with you guys today and with the guys, along with the guys at Avalanche, to talk about our journey together. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Alexis Russell. I'm a producer at Avalanche Studios. Uh, I work extensively with the art teams, with the audio teams, uh, and of course with the UI UX team, among others. Um, I have been in the industry for uh, four or five years now, uh, and in, during that time, I've gotten to work with a lot of amazing teams and a lot of amazing projects. Uh, I worked on Bioshock The Collection, XCOM 2, uh, obviously the Just Cause franchise. Um, I was even part of an outsourcing team uh, that did some uh, external development on God of War. So I'm hoping that my er, experiences on both sides of this pipeline can be of use to you today. Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Steve Woodzell. As Alexis said, I'm the senior UI artist at Avalanche New York. Um, I've been in AAA for going on five years. Um, but before that, I worked in a wide variety of multimedia, graphic design, illustration, all over the place. Um, a big chunk of that time, I spent about seven years as a one-man art department for a DJ agency, um, which is where I picked up a lot of my web design and uh, original UI understanding. I uh, transitioned out of that into freelancing, mostly doing soundtracks for indie games in New York. Um, and that's what led me to Avalanche in 2015, where I started as a lowly UI contractor making icons for JC3. Um, and when we kicked off JC4, I took over art direction for UI. And uh, when we got around to the post-launch features that we're going to be talking about today, I also started to absorb the UX high-level direction as well and um, worked closely with BCOM to make all of that happen. Um, so I'm going to try and provide some context from the art side and the design side and um, how we sort of structured things in our development process to uh, facilitate the stuff that these guys were doing. Uh, before we get down into the nitty-gritty of what we're actually going to talk about, uh, it would be helpful to give you all some... Uh, context for what Just Cause 4 is, because we're going to be talking pretty extensively about the post-launch development. So instead of me talking about it, let's start with a video trailer of what Just Cause 4 is. I can feel it in the air, yeah. Everything we dealing with is here. Underestimated is why we taking it there. There's nothing I ain't seen. My team's always prepared. Cause begging, but don't be out here acting like you didn't know us. Why you out here bluffing when you know we sure? We don't even know the meaning of this. It hit me like a
If you haven't had your afternoon coffee yet, I really hope that woke you up. Uh, so what is Just Cause 4? It's an open world action adventure game. It is developed by Avalanche Studios and published by Square Enix. Uh, you play as Rico Rodriguez, a former secret agent who can traverse any terrain via grappling hook, wingsuit, and parachute. Uh, so in Just Cause 4, uh, the player is visiting the fictional South American country of Solis, where Rico is trying to unravel some of the mysteries from his past, uh, specifically about his father, and of course, in classic Just Cause fashion, overthrowing a dictator along the way. So Just Cause 4 is a massive game, and it was a massive undertaking to make. So how did we, as the developers, feel going to the post-launch process? So during the summer of 2018, uh, we were heading quickly towards uh, finally Just Cause 4, uh, and it was a very stressful process. Uh, the main game was really all-consuming. Uh, we were hoping that we could move people on to the concept phase for DLC post-production, um, but really we were all hands on deck trying to get the main game out the door. This hit UI, UX particularly hard, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. That is a team that really gets hit by last-minute bugs. Um, and, you know, the publisher, Square Enix, was also very focused on the um, main game launch. Uh, so just in general, everybody kind of put the DLC to the side for a bit. Uh, this hit the DLC uh, and post-launch process really hard in a few different ways. Um, really, the concept phase was disjointed and understaffed. Uh, so there was a point where we got, you know, 30, 40 people onto the team, and they didn't know what to do yet. Um, we tried, we knew that we were going to need UI, UX help, especially because of how many bugs that were hitting uh, during the main game phase. So we'd reached out to Becom pretty early um, for assistance with that because we knew we needed it. Uh, but unfortunately, even then, things were constantly changing. It took, uh, I think, months after our initial contact before we finally knew what we needed from Becom as a partner uh, and, you know, get that deal signed. Uh, bottom line, though, is that we needed a partner that could help us out uh, in all of this craziness. So originally, the plan was that uh, Becom was going to do full ownership of UI, UX pipelines. So they would have a team of programmers, artists, uh, you know, designers, and we would just say, here's the brief, go do it, uh, give it back to us later, uh, and awesome. That's going to be awesome. So cool. Um, and, you know, that's how we had envisioned it, but really because of all the changes that I talked about earlier, uh, because of concept phase wasn't as successful as we may have wanted it to be at the time, uh, we really couldn't just kind of give something to Becom, to give them a spec and say, here, go run with it, um, because things were changing constantly. So we needed to stay involved as a studio, uh, and we determined that a co-development structure, one that consisted of a UI UX strike team within Avalanche, uh, and designers and artists at Becom is what we really needed to achieve the goals that Square Enix and Avalanche Studios had for the post-launch development stuff. So what are some challenges and opportunities that this afforded us? So we'll start with the hard part. Uh, there's a lot of production challenges with working with any outsourcer. Uh, some of them were specific to this project. Some of them I think all of you are familiar with. Uh, the first is aligning goals for a remote stakeholder uh, is always difficult. Um, you know, our publisher was in London, we were in New York, Becom is in Montreal, uh, we have another studio in Stockholm. How do we keep everybody aligned and be able to communicate consistently across all of our studios? Uh, onboarding a new partner. So Square Enix and Avalanche had been working together at this point for um, over a decade, I think. I don't remember the number of years, but for a very long time. Uh, so how do we bring in a new partner into this relationship uh, and make it cohesive and make it work together? Uh, maintaining deadlines, obviously we're on very tight schedules. Uh, how do we create something interesting uh, in the short amount of time that we have? And managing publisher expectations is always a huge uh, concern of a developer, so that was another concern. And finally, uh, mitigating engine restrictions. So the Apex engine is the proprietary engine that Avalanche uses, and we uh, do not provide it to different outsourcers. So how do we provide Becom with enough information, even though we can't actually give them our source code? Um, aside from the production challenges, we have art and design challenges. Yes. So uh, we had a number of things to deal with on the design side. The main thing going into it, these are a couple of the primary things we're dealing with. There's some smaller issues as well. But the first thing we ran into was the fact that we had already shipped the game. So the main uh, menu design was locked. We didn't want to change the experience for players that had the game. We also didn't have the time or resources to go in and rework the code and everything. So we had a design that was pretty minimal, it was all text-based, and we were pretty much stuck with it. Um, within that menu, we had to put these new features that had to support progression and um, new gameplay mechanics and uh, a gateway to our store and a bunch of things that we couldn't really do 
just through text. So we had a design that was locked and a design that didn't support the features that we needed it to do. And then on top of that, we have an art direction style that's a little weird. I'm going to get into that later. Um, it's kind of esoteric. It doesn't really speak for itself very well. And it's uh, difficult to extract UI solutions from it. Um, so that created a sort of additional layer of communication direction challenges for us as we were working with BCOM. And that's where we came in. <laughs> so on our end, of course, the challenge, I think Alexis just mentioned, we couldn't play the DLC. So we, of course, you know, we had to find different ways uh, to get familiar with the game. So we were also unfamiliar with Avalanche uh, post-launch production pipeline. So we had to adapt, but I think you know, everything went kind of smoothly. You mentioned the visual orientation. Of course, uh, that's, not, that's not a style that you, know, that you see quite a lot. So we had to adapt to that as well. Uh, and tight schedule. I mean, no time for trial and error. So even though there are all these challenges, there's a lot of opportunities that this afforded us. Uh, first, Avalanche was able to do more and better UI through collaboration with BCOM. Uh, if we did this successfully, we would be able to plug up the holes that we had in production, as well as be able to kind of sneak in some new content that we were overscoped for originally. Yeah, um, as Alexis mentioned just now, we had a, we had a cool opportunity in the menu. Um, as I said, we had this issue with the menu being designed. Our solution to that was pretty blunt. We literally just had an option in the menu that hid the whole menu, created an empty space where we slapped a new interface in, which gave BCOM an entirely open format to work its new designs into. Um, and what that actually let us do was piggyback the DLC features. There was a progression um, system in DLC where you would be rewarded with these customization screen, um, skins. excuse me, And that was something we used in the main game that hadn't been represented very well because we had this very basic menu. So being able to put this new interface in, we could actually roll the main game feature into the DLC interface. And we kind of got like a free uh, upgrade to this main game experience that we were sort of unsatisfied with at launch. Um, so it was a nice little freebie for us on the design side. And then um, for me personally, the, being able to work creatively within the art style with a new set of minds after being, having such an insular kind of process with it for so long is just a really gratifying creative experience. And on our end, uh, this project, of course, allowed us uh, to further, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, further <laughs> develop our UI UX expertise uh, on AAA games um, and to learn new processes along the way. Uh, also, uh, discover, you know, great friends along the way because I think, you know, as you work on a daily basis with great human beings, uh, you're rewarded with great friendships. Uh, and that open-mindedness that you guys had uh, about all along the process really helped. Uh, but most of all, we were able to build a new partnership uh, with one of the top AAA game developers in the world. So how did we go about setting this up? So the solution is really figuring out how to divide and conquer all of the work that we had. To give you a sense of scope, uh, this is the post-launch development plan for, uh, for Just Cause 4. So it starts with three core DLCs. Um, these are really kind of the classic DLC in the sense that there's a new content drop with uh, lots of extra gameplay, extra characters, some storylines, motion graphics, etc. cetera. Um, these were the main chunks of content that were released every couple of months. Now in between that, we have uh, extra vehicles. So the black market is a feature that is, um, has been in the Just Cause series in previous installments, uh, but it was new to Just Cause 4. Uh, in Solis uh, and in the world of Just Cause, Rico can really do anything. And so the idea is that his vehicles also allow you to do whatever you want. So we thought, you know what? We'll give you more stuff to do. Why not some toy vehicles? Why not some soaring speed pack? Uh, the soaring speed pack, which is a flying car and some other stuff. Uh, on top of the additional content, um, there are also challenges. So our players, uh, we're fortunate to have a player base that comes back to us uh, fairly regularly. Uh, this was meant to be kind of a reward for that player base. Um, it is high skill end game content uh, that builds upon the gameplay design of the original, uh, or of the original core game uh, in a really interesting way. And for completing that, uh, you get a lot of bragging rights. Uh, you get really cool skins to put on your character. Uh, and so you can show off your skills online. But really, it's a lot of work to get through. So how did we deal with all of this stuff? And especially, how did we bring BCOM into the loop with all of this? So first off, we had to figure out how to divide the labor. Um, one of the key challenges of co-development is deciding how to divide the tasks. And most of our other outsourcing pipelines, uh, we have a much more clear-cut division between who does what. Um, it's a lot more of a here we create a brief, 
Uh, we give it to the outsourcer. They produce an asset or sets of assets, whatever it is, bring it back, and we ingest it. Uh, for this, we couldn't really do that because of how uh, UI and UX development works. Um, there were still some elements of the pipeline that was clearly cut off. Uh, one of those was gameplay programming. Like I mentioned earlier, the Apex engine is proprietary, and uh, Avalanche Studios does not uh, provide it to outsourcers. So because of that, we had to do all of the coding internally. Um, so we made sure that the design worked with um, our code, and then our internal team did that. However, um, UX and UI goes through so many iteration processes, there's really no start and stop point because there's so many feedback loops and you're talking to each other and you're talking to the, developer, to the publisher, um, so it goes back and forth. So what we did was uh, develop clear roles first off. So for example, on the UI team, uh, Steve was in charge of the art direction. Um, I was producing for Avalanche side. Um, there's someone else in charge of producing on the BCOM side. Uh, and we had artists on the BCOM side who provided and uh, fit uh, assets to the art direction that Steve had provided. Uh, the other thing we did is made sure we had clear communications platforms. So uh, the communications platform that we happened to pick was Bootcamp. Uh, the reason for this is that it was very artist friendly. Um, you know, internally we use different, uh, different task tracking, but depending on the needs of the particular team, and in this case, uh, Bootcamp was the best option for us, uh, we uh, tailored our communication platform to meet their needs. Finally, uh, we set up uh, expected touch points all throughout the development process. So, for example, we would meet once a week, have a weekly call. Uh, I met with the producer on the BCOM side uh, multiple times a week, uh, and there were several ad hoc uh, meetings in between as well. Uh, so, in essence, what we did is create a really tight, agile pipeline uh, just for the UX and UI teams. So now that the pipeline was more set up, we could focus on some of the external factors. Um, there is Square Enix involved in all of the development on Just Cause 4 and the post-launch development, and there, this was no different for the UX and the UI. Um, you know, the UX and the UI for the post-launch content, for the uh, vehicles, for the challenges, was very tightly tied to how Square actually wanted to manage um, the community and uh, the post-launch uh, environment of Just Cause 4 to create that long tail. So they wanted to be part of that feedback loop. Now, fortunately for us, uh, we already had a really well-established feedback loop with Square, between Square and Avalanche. So uh, what we did was kind of incorporate BCOM's work into that. So during the main game, we had touch points roughly once a month or so. Um, because we were iterating so heavily, and this was a feature that touched any player playing the game, because it's the main menu, it's the first thing you see, uh, we tightened those feedback loops with Square to roughly once a week, once every two weeks, uh, and pretty regularly sent uh, wireframes, sketches, deliverables, so that they could be added to the feedback loop. Um, and then obviously uh, deadlines are another major uh, external factor that we couldn't really change. Um, so we mitigated that by increasing the feedback loops, but also cutting down the time between feedback and actually actioning on that feedback. Um, and this really helped to mitigate, mitigate uh, the tight timelines for the UI UX. So uh, it would help for you to know a little bit more about the art direction for this. And for that, I'm going to turn you over to Steve. Yes. Let's talk about art direction. Um, so I'm going to take a quick detour here to kind of explain what our art direction was. I know I mentioned it was a complicated and weird thing, so I'm going to try to point out some of the ways in which it was complicated and weird so that you can understand what VCOM was having to deal with. Um, and then before I do that, I want to give a little bit more context to why we made those choices. Um, so these first couple slides here are just going to be a quick overview of the game. Um, when we got into just, uh, just Cause 4, the team was mostly people that had just come off JC3. Um, and we all loved JC3. It had infinite C4. You've got Rico and all denim. Um, we had a beautiful uh, Mediterranean island nation. But there was a real kind of thirst in the studio to take the franchise further, do something deeper with it, bring some new aspects into the gameplay. We had this very established um, chaos kind of model to the gameplay. And we wanted to try to find some new angles to bring into that. Um, and just make it a more rich experience than we'd had so far in uh, the JC series. So right at the outset, the art director and I decided that we wanted to make sure the UI was doing something somewhat unique. We didn't want it to be stereotypical, you know, sci-fi UI or like very dry kind of minimal stuff. We wanted to do something that was going to be bold and impactful and like really reflect the game on a more subjective level. Um, so what we started looking at was like the intangible qualities of the game, which is like the setting and the narrative and the feel of the gameplay, and trying to think about how we can bring that into an aesthetic. So to understand some of the things we were looking at in the game, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but um, some of the points that we were looking at from the game are the narrative, which Alexis touched on. We have this 
uh, Mediterranean, or sorry, South American nation that's um, being oppressed by an authoritarian force called the Black Hand. And at the very beginning of the game, Rico shows up and he inadvertently triggers a grassroots revolution. And the progression in the game is tied to this revolution sweeping across the island. Um, so we were trying to find ways to pull that progression into the UI in a visual sense. There was also um, this idea of mystery. Uh, Rico's trying to find out about his dad. There's sort of hidden truths in the society of Solis, the fictional nation. Um, so we were trying to reflect this. This was a design pillar called Solis has her secrets. And we were trying to somehow evoke that in how the player's experiencing the UI. Um, so the way that we tried to evoke these things is a little difficult, but um, what we ended up doing was taking an abstract, non-diegetic approach. And um, I don't know, I know some people are unfamiliar with the term diegetic. I imagine a lot of you guys are, but just to quickly go over it in this context, um, in terms of UI, that means it's an element that's actually in the game world and can be perceived by characters in the game world. Um, classic examples are like the Pip-Boy in Fallout, uh, the Focus in Horizon Zero Dawn, Dead Space has that spacesuit health bar thing. Those are all classic diegetic UI. We did not want to do that because we didn't really see how we could um, invest the time into making a feature like that good and also be able to get this sort of soft value expression from it that we wanted that was going to evoke the feel of the game more so than like tangible references inside the game world. So we decided that right at the outset and already sort of setting ourselves up for a challenge of how are we going to create any kind of comprehensible aesthetic out of that. Um, so we started looking, as I said, at setting and narrative. We went to uh, South American graffiti to try to get a feel for like South American street art. What are the native Salesians going to be doing around, you know, around their towns? Um, we looked at a lot of uh, propaganda because we wanted to pull out this grassroots revolution feel. Um, and we were also trying to invoke this sort of um, murky, murky saturated feel that I guess, you know, you could so associate with a South American jungle and you can associate with the theme of mysteries again. Um, and then on the more dry side, we were trying to use the layouts of the actual screens to uh, avoid the kind of website feel. We wanted to really diminish a lot of like borders and panels and stuff and instead let the content really be foreground elements that kind of hold their own space and use, you know, size contrast and things like that to create delineations. And I'll get into a little more detail on that in a second here. Um, so this is a really early mood board we did to try and like nail down some of this stuff. This is really early concept art for the Army of Chaos there. Um, and the color space here is just us trying to differentiate a really loose representation of the authoritarian government uh, juxtaposed with this very vibrant, you know, um, indigenous culture that Rico's trying to um, liberate. Um, so as I mentioned, propaganda was a big one for us. And um, this uh, style of illustration here is one of the things that we kept running into problems with, or not problems, but challenges. Um, it's a very particular approach. Uh, it came from looking at a lot of like mid-century Soviet propaganda, stuff like that. Um, and we wanted to think about what would the Army of Chaos, what would they be making? If they were going to make communications and they were going to make stuff to push their cause, what would it look like? And we wound up on this sort of approach. And um, it's a tricky thing. It's sort of, when you see it, it sort of seems very obvious, but we found that a lot of people would look at it and they would go, oh, it's comic books. And we would kind of go, well, it's not quite comic books. You know, the proportions are actually very realist and the presentation is very stylized. Um, and it just became a, it becomes a tricky thing to communicate um, because you can't really, this is a theme I'm going to keep going back to, you can't really turn it into a list of guidelines. It becomes more of a creative discussion about how, how we're thinking about these sort of images. And um, this is one of the things that we had to communicate to BCOM. This color thing I mentioned earlier. So this color palette right here is the uh, Army of Chaos branding. You can see those concepts again from early on. Um, this is how we wanted to bring the Army of Chaos into this abstract UI. So one of the ideas we had was that the UI would progressively color itself in with the Army of Chaos branding, reflecting them moving across the world. So as you're unlocking things, as you're progressing, your UI is moving from this dark gray into this vibrant you know, thing here. Um, we also were just using this as a sort of general like highlight effect. The challenge here is that there's three very bold colors in there. And if you've done UI, you know that color coding is pretty tricky. There's only so many colors you can use before they don't really mean anything anymore because you can't quickly differentiate them. So by using this, we're using three colors together in various places, blocking out huge chunks of the color spectrum right off the bat. So again, we would have artists come in and they would look at this and say, oh, I can make something that's purple. 
But we would say, well, you can't really make something that's purple because purple doesn't mean anything. It's actually just part of this like weird paint splatter thing that we've been using. So this was another kind of strange situation that we had to try to communicate to um, the artists we were working with. And then um, I mentioned this before as well. This is a visual space thing. Um, you can see here, I, at least I hope you can see here what we were trying to do. We really wanted to get these kind of delineations very subdued um, to try and, first of all, make it feel more like propaganda so we could maintain that kind of, you know, punchy, exaggerated feel. Um, but then also just avoid a lot of extra noise uh, and make sure that the screens were composed as much as possible of purely content. So we have, like, rather than having a title with a line and a block of text, we're just going to have a big title and moderately sized text and let the contrast between the font sizes create the delineation. So we were trying to do a lot of things like that to make it feel more dynamic and spacious and kind of like um, shapes existing in a space rather than things plastered on a screen. And again, this is something that just creates a lot of challenges for UI because you need delineation in UI. You know, you have to have panels and stuff. Obviously, we couldn't build this screen without some kind of paneling. Um, so this was another kind of tricky thing that we had to try and balance. So that was an early mock-up. This is one of the screens that we shipped with, and I think you can see here that like some of the things I talked about are represented, some of them are not. Um, over the course of development, we had a lot of design changes, we had a lot of iteration across the board, of course, um, and you simply had to make some compromises with some of this stuff. So what we ended up with when we launched and the stuff that BCOM received when they jumped on board was kind of a mix of things that were intentionally designed and things that had been sort of the result of circumstance, where we just kind of had to pivot. Um, which, again, added another layer of like difficult communication for us in terms of art direction. Because how do you explain something where you're saying, this is what we meant to do, but this is also the way it is because it has to be. And you have to sort of reconcile these sometimes conflicting priorities. So, to sum all that up, we've got a difficult illustration style that uh, sometimes it's very easy to do, sometimes it's very hard to do. We've got color usage, doesn't totally make sense. We didn't have a lot of templates that could be easily tossed over so that they could just populate them with content. Um, the design doesn't really give you clear guidelines for how to make, you know, typical UI features like a progress bar. You can't look at this thing and say, oh, okay, I know what a progress bar looks like. You sort of have to, like, make it up each time. And then, uh, as Fred mentioned, we didn't have a whole lot of time for iteration either, so we couldn't, like, spend a bunch of time feeling it out. You know, we kind of had to just get there. Um, so what we landed on, what I found most effective from the developer side for this kind of situation where we have this very subjective, uh, very kind of unquantifiable art style in a lot of ways that has a lot of artistic liberty built into it, um, we found it most effective rather than to try and like enforce a set of guidelines. You know, it's very easy with a simpler style to just take a style guide that says, if you've got a box, you've got 20 pixels here and 40 pixels here, and you have a really clear set of values you can give somebody, that doesn't really work with this stuff. Um, what we found much more effective was to get into a much deeper creative conversation about intentions and the sort of artistic basis for choices we're making. Um, and it was a different approach to feedback because you can't really just use this metric of accuracy. It's more like opening up a creative conversation with the artist, kind of getting them to personally buy in on the intentions of the art style so that they can sort of work autonomously within the art style. And then the conversations we end up having are more like art school discussions rather than, you know, rote feedback stuff, you know, instead of being like, what does a box look like in JC4? It's kind of more like, well, how are we, how are we even using boxes in JC4? What is a box in JC4? Um, and while that seems like it could send you off into a crazy tangent, we found that it, it was, it opened us up to a much quicker iteration time because people could just kind of get the intention of the whole thing and get themselves there organically, cut down a lot of the feedback time. And then also I think we had a lot of artists that were much more invested in this because they could sort of find the fun in making these kind of images. Because once you understand the point of it, it becomes pretty entertaining. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail later on about our lessons from that. But that was our sort of main takeaways for how to handle this very particular art direction with a lot of communication challenges. This portion of the presentation is more about how we've balanced flexibility and workflow and how we've worked together. So let's begin. So our mission for this mandate was quite simple. Review and optimize user experience from a UX standpoint of key menu screens and flow, but also produce visual asset using the different context throughout the game experience. So since the beginning, when we started the discussion with Avalanche, we were really excited to work uh, with you guys, uh, especially because a lot of our team members were big fans 
of the Just Cause franchise. We couldn't mess it up. So like Rico, <laughs> we fiercely dove into this project with all our drive to succeed and skills. So um, as a vendor, uh, when you start to work with a client, it's easy to fall into different trap or stick to what, whatever methodology you already use. Uh, it often ends up creating lots of blockers. So we absolutely had to avoid that. Uh, so we made sure that you know, we kept an open mind, uh, had a lot of discussion, established strong communication channel. Uh, and at the end of the day, you, know, you need to be able to fill the gap, <laughs> be creative, and continue the production with what you have. So a little bit more about our UX process. Um, at Beacom, we do offer the full spectrum of UX services, from the in initial uh, competitive analysis uh, to the interface prototyping. In the context of Just Cause Project, uh, we needed to work quickly. Uh, and it was impossible uh, to really apply all of the usual steps, so we needed to find a way to take shortcuts. So uh, I'll go back to the, the process after, but we decided to focus on some of the following steps. These steps are all in these four uh, main uh, steps or uh, part of the plan. So research phase, structure, design, and prototype, each of these uh, have subsets of uh, tasks to complete. So, uh, but we decided to focus on some of them, not all of them, because for time constraints. So com uh, we decided to go with com competitive analysis. We needed to do that. So that one was really fun, of course, because we played a lot of games, and uh, we've learned uh, about some of the competitors uh, and you know, within the same type of genre. Uh, also interviews and survey, which is another step. Uh, we didn't have time to go and start focus group and, and do trial and error. So the good thing is user, user reviews are always your best source of information. So we had uh, several, several people at Beacom just go back, read some reviews on Just Cause 3, and other reviews about similar games and similar genre. So that way we capture a lot of data that we could uh, go through afterward and, and, and create a plan. Uh, use cases, so we've developed use cases based on different player feedbacks and their, pl their platform of choice. At this point, we felt we had enough information to really start working. UX design principles. So Avalanche had preliminary interface work done, like Steve mentioned. So you, these guys had a lot already in place. So, um, and we knew at the beginning our added value UX-wise would be in the details. So small changes and adjustment that would create a big impact on the overall user experience. So we also had to take into account the different types of players. Of course, the Just Cause franchise hardcore fan, we had to take them into eye consideration, but also we had to consider the new players. So, um, and make sure that new players would also have a fluid menu navigation experience. Uh, and on top of that, Just Cause is a multi-platform game that needs to be easy to play on PC and console, which add to the, uh, the challenge. Uh, at every step of the way, we needed to make sure that these three, to keep these three principles in mind. So sketching, this is some, most of the time people just skip this portion, but for us it's, it's one of the most critical portion. Uh, I cannot emphasize more that part of the, of the work of the UX design. So uh, sketching is often overlooked, an overlooked phase in the UX process, but it's actually the most useful. So in a game development project, you probably all know that the most valuable resource is, is time. <laughs> So sketching allows us to quickly figure out if our early assumptions and intuition of what the screen would look like were on point uh, and make sense uh, uh, without investing a lot of time. So we could quickly iterate to find uh, the best layout that could work for every menu section. And, and again, add several conversations quickly, so fast turnaround, we could exchange pretty quickly uh, on, 
on the different screen, along with Steve and the team, and Alexis. So this is a quick look of the wireframe that we devised together and worked together on. So uh, throughout the UX phase, uh, we focus on improving four things in the menu navigation flow and, and screens. So what's at stake? Uh, the reward is the incentive. We wanted to show it big and bold. Uh, the sense of progression. A progress bar is displayed on every of the challenges, so uh, the, the player can see his progress and when he's about to reach the goal. And also the progression status uh, clearly show the progress status, including not started, ongoing, and uh, of course, claim. Uh, and also the navigation also changed the way players can navigate through the different challenges, cycling through with the controller, will offer a quick way to see all challenges. And you probably can see, but we also, there's, a, there's more coming. You can easily see that there's a, another challenge coming your way. So we also did uh, additional work outside of the monthly challenges. Uh, you, Steve mentioned a couple of uh, things we've worked together on. But the monthly challenges is one of the features we worked on. We also uh, provided UX design services for a series of menu screens, uh, such as the character customization, stash sections. Uh, that This allowed us to have a better synergy throughout the navigation and menu experience in the game. So testing. How do we test all of this with so, <laughs> so limited time? Uh, so what we did, we did in-house testing. Uh, and of course, you absolutely need to do some user testing. That's how you validate your work. So since time wasn't on, on our side, uh, we found a solution. So we just grabbed uh, a lot of folks at Beacon. So we have like 95 resources. So we, we selected people that already played previous Just Cause game and some that weren't even aware that it existed. And then we've put them together and we've validated or, uh, or work with them, retrieve feedback, and then iterate on. And then after that, we provided uh, a new set of wireframes to uh, Avalanche. The final UI was produced by the Avalanche team. This is a result. Uh, but this collab collaboration allowed us to, allowed us to produce a kick-ass, user-friendly challenges feature that helped increase the retention and engagement with players. So let's talk a little bit more about UI. Again, we have a four-step process that we use internally. So let's go a little bit more deeper into it. So learn is the phase where we learn from the client. So all the discussion we had, of course, uh, all of the image send all way uh, videos uh, and everything that the Avalanche guys uh, send all way and the discussion we had about the style. Uh, and then after that, we had to understand the project background, so our designer got fully briefed uh, along with the UX guys. So uh, it was a process uh, that took around maybe a couple of days to get, and lots of uh, sketching, drawing to get the style. Uh, and then after that, understand the project background, of course, set the expectation. So we knew exactly what these guys had in mind, so we had to reach uh, the, uh, the quality that they were re requiring. Uh, again, even our designer, they had to play the game to understand, to have the feel, feel of it, uh, and, and also earn the style, which was critical for this project. You know, that was a really specific style. And we were lucky, we have very talented artists, I think we're a good matchup, and then we, we nailed it. Uh, again, uh, the third step, design, which is actually the time where you're putting everything together. So applying all of the the style and the, the look and feel over these wireframes, so uh, it looks cool, and everybody is, is a, a understand what, what they, and can reach what they're looking for. And we also did a, lot, a bunch of UI assets, like icons, navigation items, et cetera. And then you, you just repeat, you go to the other task. So who did what? Here are a couple of examples. So can, can you guys tell which one is Avalanche, which one is Become? I, I don't know if you can make the difference, uh, but I hope you do because I, I cannot tell which one is yours. So essentially, that's, that, that's the goal. So from scratch to awesome, uh, just going over uh, to speed things up, uh, we've defined a process together. It is a 
essentially, uh, Avalanche team would send a bunch of in-game reference along with a brief, so lots of screenshot of game, game action. And then our artists would uh, just draft quick uh, illustration of what, what, what they had in mind. And then we would iterate on these quick sketches. That, that was saving a lot of time. And once we, have, uh, once we were in agreement with the, the, the sketches and the final pause <laughs> or the final vehicles or whatnot, then, then we started iterating on applying the style. And once the recipe was well established, the, the process was going quite fast. So because we didn't have the luxury of a lot of iteration time, like I said multiple times, <laughs> uh, we approached the assets and file deliveries with a modular mindset to anticipate large state design changes. So Steve, that's the point where yes. I'm ending you out. Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit more about these icons because I think this was a good example of uh, how we sort of adapted our workflow to uh, getting through all this stuff. So these icons represented uh, various vehicles you can get in DLC 1, and you earn these by winning races, and they come with different attachments. So this was central progression in DLC 1, and due to the nature of development, what these attachments were was changing like constantly for a long time. So uh, what we ended up doing was actually getting BCOM to set these things up uh, in a modular format. So we basically had these kind of templates that we could mix and match that just let us uh, adapt to the uh, design changes pretty much instantly on our side. And it, it's like a simple solution and it's not terribly elaborate, but it's like that kind of thinking that I think really let us get through a lot of these other challenges of just being able to shift how we were approaching things into something that's more flexible. Now we're going to look at a quick run through of BCOM's fantastic work. So this is a taste of what came out of this. about uh, things that we learned from this process and just wrap it up a little bit. Uh, so, you know, for me, I think the key lesson that I learned is, um, you know, be adaptive and allow your outsourcing partners to come up with problems that you hadn't thought of, come up with solutions that you hadn't thought of. Uh, we all have this impulse to give the grunt work to the outsourcing team, uh, and that's really just kind of a backwards idea. Um, you know, we're creative individuals, our outsourcing partners are creative individuals, and if we let them, uh, you know, really flex those muscles, that we, we come up with something that is better than what the original team had. Uh, yeah, I think um, from the art direction side, it was a very similar experience, as Alexa said. It was really about uh, being able to adapt. We were a pretty small team on JC4, and we had really established kind of rhythms so uh, going into the post-launch phase, we had to kind of like break apart how we were thinking about this stuff a little bit. And it was really valuable. And it was just uh, having an openness to collaboration and a openness to creative collaboration. And I think um, from the art direction and design standpoint, one thing that was really valuable for us was that it forced us to like understand the product even more because we couldn't sort of depend on the fact that the guy sitting next to you for the last two years had this implicit knowledge of everything. So we had to kind of think deeper about how we were communicating about our own stuff so that we could talk to these guys. Yeah, and from our point of view, you know, we needed to be the solution. We needed to help you guys. Uh, we, we understood all of the, the different challenges you guys were facing. But I think that the main goal for us was to create these, these uh, strong partnership links, uh, being, uh, you know, a, an extension of your team. I think we've achieved that. Uh, we had a... A lot of fun working together, and uh, uh, I think I hope it, it's going to continue. Uh, but also, you know, just to summarize, uh, I would say flexibility, communication, and of course, talented resources on both sides uh, are the perfect ingredient for success. Uh, so that's all we got for you.